My name is Aaron Stalker. I'm an Extension Beef Specialist with the University of Nebraska. We've been doing some work with feeding distillers grains on the ranch and a few of the practical applications. And I just wanted to share a few thoughts with you about that today. I'd like to begin by talking about the current price of distillers grains. Uh, historically speaking, prices are pretty economical at the moment, and there's some opportunity to take advantage of the nutritional benefits of distillers grains on the ranch. So I wanted to highlight them and talk about how that can be useful in forage-based beef production settings. And then uh, share some results from a couple of research projects that we've worked on, just looking at the utility of using distillers grains directly as a commodity uh, and then also as a, as a manufactured feed. So where I wanted to start was with the current price of distillers grains. This chart shows the three main distillers products that are available. The red line shows dried distillers grain. The green line is modified distillers grain. And the fuchsia line is wet distillers grain. Uh, the main difference between these products is the dry matter content. Dry distillers grains is about 90% dry matter. Modified distillers grains is about 50% dry matter and wet distillers grain is about 30% dry matter. And this chart shows the uh, relative difference in price compared to corn from 2007 up until May of this year. It's, I think it's easy to tell from the graph that uh, compared to the past 18 months or so, distillers grain's price has really declined. And it's a uh, got some economic advantages uh, when we combine that with its nutritional profile. And uh, so that's what I'd like to talk about next is the nutritional profile of distillers grains. Distillers grains is a really good source of energy. And one nice thing is that the energy comes in the form of uh, highly digestible fiber and also fat. The nice thing about this is that uh, the energy in distillers grains doesn't cause what we, what we call negative associative effects, which can sometimes be the case when we feed high starch energy sources, such as corn grain. Distillers grains uh, has the TDN content can vary depending on the application, but for forage-based diet, the energy content of distillers grains is 110% TDN. Distillers grains is also a really good source of protein, and the majority of that protein, about 65%, is in the form of ruminally undegraded protein. Uh, this is nice because in situations where the animal has a really high protein requirement, such as uh, a rapidly growing animal or a cow, say, at uh, early in lactation, the kind of protein that's in distillers grains can help meet those high protein requirements. And uh, distillers grains is also a good source of phosphorus, which is a real uh, advantage in forage-based diets because phosphorus is, can sometimes be deficient in forage-based diets. I do just want to point out a couple of limitations. One is that the fat that's in distillers grains comes from the corn oil, and it is possible that we can get what's called negative associative effects from eating too much fat in a forage-based diet. Um, a good rule of thumb is that about uh, when we reach more than 5% total fat in the diet, uh, we can start to see some inhibition of forage digestion because of the fat. But if, if we say that distillers grains is roughly 10% fat, and we assume there aren't any other sources of fat in the diet, then uh, we could feed up to 50% of the diet as distillers grains before we see any negative associated negative associative effects associated with uh, eating too much fat. So, you know, in practical terms, that's not a, much of a limitation. There aren't too many situations in a forage-based diet where we would be feeding more than half the diet on a dry matter basis. Another thing we should uh, at least keep our eyes on is the sulfur content. It can be variable, and uh, we just recommend that people uh, test their distillers grain for sulfur to make sure there's not going to be a sulfur toxicity problem. One thing
thing that is actually fairly common is because of the phosphorus that's in distiller's grain, uh, it, is, it is reasonable that we can have situations where we can get what's called a calcium phosphorus inversion. In other words, where we're feeding more phosphorus than calcium. This can lead to problems, especially in steer calves, causes urinary calculi or, or uh, water belly. And it, this is something that's really easy to fix because it's just really easy to add limestone to the diet to increase that calcium concentration. It, limestone's not very expensive, and all we need to do is just make sure that, that we're feeding more um, calcium than we are phosphorus. And we just want to make sure we're not feeding less than, say, about 1.2 1. 1. to 1 ratio of uh, calcium to phosphorus. But it's okay if we can feed a lot more calcium than phosphorus. Seven times more calcium than phosphorus without having to feed the feed on. I just next want to talk about uh, some of the forms that we can use distillers grains on the ranch. One really common method is to purchase a manufactured feed that's a cake, or it depends on in some places people refer to them as cubes. Um, there's lots of different products available that have different levels of distillers grain content. Uh, sort of recently, there's become available in Nebraska distillers grain cubes that are 100% distillers grain. Um, these make a really nice product and, and can be really attractive uh, and in certain situations. And but the amount of distillers grains in, in the cube can vary quite a bit. So that that goes along too with the protein content. They they vary. Uh, and so what's really important is that we select a product that meets our needs uh, based on its nutrition profile. So uh, we, it would be a good idea to purchase the product that's delivering the least cost protein source. Uh, we have some tools to help people do that, uh, which we'll, we can, we'll reference later in the presentation. Uh, one nice thing about feeding uh, distillers grains as a manufactured product is that it can be a vehicle for delivering trace minerals and ionophores, and this is actually a really common practice and something that we we would uh, recommend. One of the downsides about feeding a manufactured product is the additional cost associated with the manufacturing, and one of the areas that our research has focused on lately is uh, Purchasing distillers grain uh, directly from the ethanol plant uh, and feeding it as a commodity to beef cows. Uh, what I want to show here is this is a picture of some distillers grains that we uh, used in the uh, subsequent research project that I'm going to describe. I, I don't want to spend very much time talking about storing distillers grains. I think that there's potentially some real advantages to storing distillers grains. A lot of times, at least historically, the least expensive uh, time of year to buy distillers grains doesn't really coincide with the time of year that we need to feed distillers grains as a protein supplement in forage-based diet. And so storage can be a really good method to, um, to bridge the gap between the lowest price and the time that it's needed. Um, later in the presentation, I'll refer to some uh, resources that we have available if anyone's interested uh, that talk about storage. The University of Nebraska has done a lot of work on storing distillers grains and we'll, we uh, can refer to, to that information later. What I want to do now is describe a research project where we stored wet distillers grain and then fed it during the winter time as a commodity, as a supplement for pregnant cows. So. Uh, what we did is we had uh, two treatments. One group we fed the distillers grains on the ground, and the other group we fed in a bunk. Both groups were offered the same amount. And I want to show a picture of uh, us delivering the distillers grains. So the group that was fed on the ground, we just uh, uh, put the distillers grains directly on the ground and uh, allowed the cows to consume it. And um, you can see, because of the snow in this picture, that the cows were able to do a really good job of uh, cleaning up the distillers grain. So I was a little surprised when we uh, finished the 
project. It was a 90-day project we began December 1st, and it roughly coincided with the last trimester of gestation. The cattle that were fed in the bunk lost 20 pounds during the study, and the group that was fed on the ground lost 64. And you can see also that the body condition score changed. The cattle that were fed in the bunk gained 410, and the cattle that were fed on the ground made, had the exact same body condition at the beginning and end of the project. In, in this study, we fed the equivalent of one pound of dry matter. We actually delivered it three days a week, but on a dry matter basis, it was one pound per day. We wanted to repeat this project and see if we could uh, get the similar results with calves. So um, these are some March born calves. We started feeding um, right after weaning, so from the middle of October to the middle of December. And the calves that were fed wet distiller strain in a bunk gained 0.64 pounds per day, and the ones fed on the ground gained 0.44 pounds. So exactly two-tenths of a pound greater average daily gain when we offered the distiller strain in a bunk compared to on the ground. Uh, wh what we wanted to do was conduct an economic analysis of this study. So uh, we first started out with calculating the cost of our bunks. We, we uh, didn't do a complete cost difference in this study. What we did is what's called a partial budget. So we only analyzed those costs that would be different between the two treatments. We, our cost for feeding in the bunks was 16 cents per day. So that included the purchase, delivery, tax, depreciation, and setup of the bunk. What was not included in the cost was moving between pastures. For this study, the cattle stayed in the exact same pasture uh, for the duration of the study. So costs would be different if we were uh, moving the bunks up between pastures. Another cost that we didn't account for was any damage to the pasture at the site where we fed the distillers grain. Uh, we conducted this project in the sand hills, and one of the uh, concerns about feeding in the exact same location every day is the um, damage that can be caused by the cattle congregating in the same site every day. Uh, another cost or benefit, I guess, to feeding on the ground that we didn't account for was the fertilizer value of the waste. Um, when we went the next year to the sites where we had delivered the distiller's grain uh, on the ground, we could see a noticeable difference in the growth of the grass in that site. And, but, but that is something that we did not account for in, in this analysis. And uh, basically, everybody's costs are going to be different uh, depending on lots of different factors. So uh, we don't need to have our costs uh, be represented Okay, so in addition to the cost of the bunk, what we also need to do is calculate the cost of the wasted distiller's grain. And that wasn't nearly as straightforward as being able to calculate the bunk cost. We had to sort of come at it from a different way. And what we did is we used the National Research Council uh, nutrient requirements for beef cattle to calculate uh, how much waste there is based on the animal performance. So what we did is we first, we assumed that feeding the distiller strains in the bunk eliminated 100% of the waste. And the, uh, we knew that the difference in gain between the two treatments was two-tenths of a pound a day. And based on our knowledge of the nutrient content of the gain and the nutrient content of the distiller strain, we calculated that there must have been 0.3 pounds of distillers grains wasted. So of the 0.22 that we offered, 0.3 pounds on a dry matter basis was wasted. And that, that represented 14% of what was offered. So if we, using a $200 per ton on a dry matter basis price for wet distillers grain, then 3 tenths of a pound would equal uh, the waste, the value of the wasted distillers grain was 3 cents per day. So, and I think uh, one of the things that is just sort of a straightforward comparison, the three cents per day of wasted distillers grains is much less than the cost of, of the purchasing the, the bunk. And so uh, uh, it, it might
might be a, easy to jump to the uh, conclusion that the least expensive method is to just feed the distiller's grains on the ground. And I think that in certain situations that's certainly true. Let's say that um, what we're interested in is programming these calves. We want a specified average daily gain, and so the, um, the best choice then would be to choose the least cost of gain, which in this case would be feeding on the ground, because the three cents per day wasted distillers grains is much less than the cost of the farm. I think there are other there are particular situations where um, actually feeding in the bunk would be uh, more economical, so the most profitable uh, method. And a good example of that would be like that to say that the calves were going to be sold immediately at the end of the feeding period. So in that case, then the greater the weight that, that you have to sell, the The method that we'd like to choose would, that results in the more weight would be the most favorable. And that's particularly true with today's calf prices, where the value of each pound of gain is so high right now. Um, if the calves are going to be sold at the end of the feeding period, then it would, would be better to feed in the bunk uh, because the actual cost of not feeding in the bunk would be the decreased sale weight, right? Because we got two tenths of a pound a day better gain by feeding in the bunk. Those calves weighed more at the end of the feeding period. And uh, we estimated that the, the price of the calf has to be less than uh, 82 cents, eighty-two dollars per hundred weight in order to justify not feeding in the bunk. And with today's prices, or were the calves, depending on on their actual weight will be worth two to three times more than uh, than that price, where it would be more economical to feed on the ground. So basically, I think to kind of summarize that, there are instances where it does make sense if we're feeding on a cost of gain, we want the lowest cost of gain, that feeding on the ground would be the appropriate choice. But if we're selling the calves at the end of the feeding period where the actual cost is the decreased sale weight, then with today's prices, it's definitely more economical to feed in a bunk than it is to feed on the ground. What I want to do next is move into a project where we were feeding dry distiller's grain. Okay, so the, the previous project was with wet distiller's grain. This is dry distiller's grain. Uh, here's some pictures of, of how we fed it. Uh, we just fed it right onto the ground, and this was on a sub-irrigated meadow that had a lot of dense vegetation. And I think when we when we get to the results, that that might have have been a factor in the results. And I just think that this picture will help uh, as we interpret the results. <clears throat> so for this project, these were some June-born calves. We fed them the equivalent of two pounds per day. On a dry matter basis, we actually delivered it three days per week. Uh, we began the 10th of March and went through the 20th of May. Uh, there were it was 0.26 pounds a day better gain if we fed in the bunk compared to feeding on the ground. If we use the same uh, methodology as the previous study to calculate how much waste there was, so using our knowledge of the animals. Um, the energy content of their gain and the energy content of the distiller's grain. In order to make up that uh, quarter pound a day difference in average daily gain, there must have been 0.8 pounds of dry distiller's grain that the, that was wasted on the ground. Okay? And uh, eight tenths of a pound equals 40% of what was offered. And again, at the $200 per ton price on a dry matter basis, that works out to be eight cents per day. Okay, so again, uh, even though there's more waste with the distiller with the dry distillers grains than wet distillers grains, still the cost of the wasted distillers grains is less than the cost of the bunk. So if our goal is to uh, program the cattle for a specific gain 
and what we're interested in is the lowest uh, cost of gain, then feeding on the ground made sense. But just like with the wet distiller's grain, if we're going to be marketing that weight uh, immediately, then the, the most economical decision is to feed in the bunk because the value of that additional quarter pound a day gain is worth more than the cost of the bunk. Uh, you can uh, read reports of this uh, work in more detail if you go to our website, beef.unl.edu, and you'll notice there's the red banner across the top. Uh, near the center is a link for reports and proceedings. If you click on that link, you'll find our uh, Nebraska Beef Report, and all of these projects are reported in the Nebraska Beef Report. I'd also like to point out in the list on the right-hand side under beef cattle production, you'll find a link for byproduct feed. And if you click on that link, it will take you to uh, this resource, which is storage of wet corn co-products. This manual describes lots of methods for storing distillers grains and uh, has, has a great deal of information. Also on that link, you'll have uh, be able to find this resource, feeding corn mill and co-products to forage fed cattle. This summarizes a lot of the research that we've done at the University of Nebraska. 